really good to be here and, and to see so many people turn out to discuss this big, big threat. The Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, is a really big threat to democracy, it's a threat to the standards that we hold dear, and it's a threat also to a lot of the public services, which I know is what Linda's going to talk about, so I'm not going to stray onto that territory. But the important thing, I think, for us to recognise about this set of negotiations towards TTIP is that they're happening right now. This is a live issue. These are negotiations taking place in secret as we speak between the European Commission and the US government. And I think what's really important, I'm really glad about Paraguay Greeks for, for bringing this whole issue here, is that there's been not enough light shone on these negotiations. It's a secret deal being negotiated by unelected officials in Brussels who have absolutely no lines of accountability to us at all. So this idea of trying to get this into the public domain, which is what we're doing here, is really, really important. And I, and I, there are three big bits to TTIP, if you want. David's talked about the first one of these, the big challenge to democracy through the investment side of it. And the third bit is going to be the public services and public procurement stuff, which Linda's talking about. I'm going to try and pick up the middle section of it, which is about deregulation. TTIP, as an agreement, is about getting rid of the regulatory barriers, in inverted commas, the things which we would consider to be the most important social and environmental and labour standards that make our lives worth living in societies, but corporations, big capital, sees as barriers to making profit. And I'm just going to give you some examples of these so we can get a sense of what's at risk here. And this isn't some conspiracy, by the way. This is what the European Commission officials and the US government officials say absolutely openly is their main focus in TTIP. It's not like previous trade agreements where you're talking about the tariff barriers. You know, the tariff barriers on steel or coffee or bananas. It's not about that because the barriers in terms of tariffs between the European Union and the US are already minimal, around 3 or 4% of average. They've said that's not where we're going to be really focusing. Our attention is getting rid of those regulations and those standards which are a barrier to business making big profits. So what are they talking about here? Well again, we don't have to guess what they're talking about because the companies have already listed all of the things that they want to get rid of as a result of these negotiations. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples from the US side looking into Europe. The first most obvious size of these is in food safety. Look over to the United States. They have a completely different regime in respect to food safety to us. In Europe, we base our food safety rules on the precautionary principle, which means you have to prove that it's safe for people to eat these things and only once you've proved it's safe can you, a company, introduce these things into our food chain. In the US it's the other way around. The government would have to prove something to be unsafe in order to block it coming into the food chain and its commercial use. And that's why there is such a huge difference in terms of what we eat. 70% of all processed food in the United States on sale in supermarkets contains GMOs. In Europe, almost nothing. And if it is containing some sort of feed, it has to be labelled. So if you want to eat GMOs, you should be signing up to TTIP because the idea of the US companies is we're fed up with not being able to sell our GM food into Europe because of the ban in Europe. We want to get rid of that type of regulatory barrier to our making profits. And that's why they've said they want to target the GM ban in Europe. Another one, 90% of beef produced in the US is produced with bovine growth hormones, where the cattle are injected with hormones in order to make them grow quicker, which means, of course, you don't have to feed them for so long, it means that they become more profitable. And these bovine growth hormones have been found to be carcinogenic by European standards. 
uh, scientists, and therefore we've had a ban on the use of these hormones and a ban on imports of US beef produced with growth hormones. The US companies are saying, we're fed up with them to a biodiversity ban. We want to use TTIP, we want to use these negotiations to get rid of that ban. Chlorine chicken. In the US, rather than following food hygiene standards all the way through the production of poultry, chicken and turkey, at the end they dump them into a big bath of chlorine. Basically, you get to sort of wash out all of the... the I'm not really this bothered about that because I'm a vegetarian, so none of this stuff really is. <laughs> but for those of you who do eat chicken, if you'd like to have your chicken with extra chlorine, then you should be backing TTIP. Because that's what the US is saying. We're fed up with not being able to get our stuff into the European market because of this ban on chlorine chicken. Similarly, in terms of pesticides, you know, huge amounts of US produce, 40% of US grains, are not allowed to get into the European market because of the high level of pesticide residue within them. And what they're saying is, we want to get rid of these barriers by harmonizing our regulations, by trying to get them down in Europe so that we can actually, as, Europe, as US companies, come in and sell more. And that also applies to the environmental side, which I'm sure that Jean will also be thinking about as well later when she talks. The European regulations, the REACH regulations on chemicals, toxic chemicals, which were introduced just six, seven years ago, they are again based on the precautionary principle. You as a company cannot introduce these toxic substances into commercial use unless you can prove they're safe. In the US, their Toxic Substances Control Act, TSCA, is entirely based on the opposite principle. And as a result of that, the US government administrators have not been able to ban any of these. They've been able to ban about six chemicals out of the 84,000 that have been introduced over the last 30, 40 years. And it goes to cosmetics, for example. In the European Union, there are about 1,200 chemicals which are not allowed to be used in cosmetics. In the States, it's 12. Precisely because the companies are not having to abide by the same sort of high standards that we have here. And again, they have said, we want to target those regulations in Europe to get rid of them so that we can sell more into the European markets. Labour standards as well. Labour standards, all corporations, whether they're based in the US or in Europe, are trying to get more profits by not having to keep labour standards and wages high. So again, the threat is, said quite clearly by the European Commission, that there will be a prolonged and substantial, their words, a prolonged and substantial dislocation of jobs as a result of TTIP. Similarly, in terms of financial regulation, but at this point, it's our companies, particularly the City of London and the German banks, which are saying, we're bored with having to abide by the US rules on financial regulation. We want to get rid of them through TTIP. So basically, it's corporations on both sides of the Atlantic saying, we want to get rid of all the rules which stop us making more profits. And, worse than that, after the TTIP has been signed in their vision of it, there's going to be a new body, a regulatory cooperation council, which is set up so that companies in the future can have a say over what regulations we might want to introduce in order to try to put social or environmental standards up. What they would be saying is, no, we're going to have a permanent base inside government in Europe and the US to try to prevent any of these standards coming back in the future. And that deregulatory agenda is the absolute centre of TTIP. Yes, the investment stuff, yes, the public services stuff, but also this deregulation agenda, which they say quite clearly is at the top of their list. There's an enormous amount which we have to be afraid of. But the thing I also promised I would talk about is that that is building this massive movement of resistance to it. And that's where I think we've got a real opportunity here. Because if you look back over the last 15 years or so, we've had some big victories when they've tried to bring in these powers for big corporations. We, we defeated the multilateral agreement on investment. I don't know if 
Many of you are part of that, that struggle, but back in 1998, when they were trying to get exactly these same investment powers through the MAI, the Multinational Agreement on Investment, we defeated it. A massive worldwide campaign shut it down. It had to be completely forgotten. They tried to reintroduce the same powers through the WTO. And again, we defeated it. They tried to expand the WTO agenda into investment, competition policy, government procurement. They failed, and in fact, the whole of the Doha round of the WTO crashed. In the Western Hemisphere, they tried to introduce the free trade area of the Americas, which like sort of NAFTA being spread throughout the entire continent. Again, completely defeated and thrown in the bin. We have the power to do this because they have bitten off more than they can chew. They've tried to squeeze everything into TTIP, investment, public services, deregulation, even fracking. On fracking, I didn't know this. Apparently the US isn't allowed to export natural resources from the US unless they've got a free trade agreement with the people they're exporting it to. They haven't got one with Europe, so they're not allowed to export the shale gas from fracking. They're not allowed to export the oil they've taken out of the tar sands in Canada to the UK or to any other place in Europe. And what they're saying is great news, you can get more fracking, you can get more oil exports, you won't have to rely on Russia and those pesky ones over there when they're being so nasty to Ukraine. You can get it from us because we're going to have TTIP and that won't open up the spigot to get it all through. But the good news, as I say, people are now seeing through the lies on this. All of the, the myths that they have put about about how there's going to be an extra 10 billion pounds into the British economy, which is what all of the MPs you'll hear in this country, oh, 10 billion pounds. We've said this to Ken Clark. What is this 10 billion pounds? Ken Clark is the UK minister who's responsible for selling TTIP to people. We said to him, well, that was 10 billion pounds. It's just rubbish, isn't it? That's not a proper, a proper figure. And he said, no, of course it's rubbish. Of course you shouldn't believe it. He said, the government doesn't even believe it. The government doesn't even believe what they're saying on jobs. And yet they're putting it out. So whenever you hear an MEP or an MP who's coming to tell you about, you know, how great TTIP is, they'll keep saying 10 billion pounds, 10 billion pounds, 10 billion pounds. Even the government doesn't believe its own figures. The trade unions, I'm really glad to say, are also joining this struggle. And more and more trade unions across Europe are saying no. The biggest European trade union, IG Metall, which is the German export-oriented trade union, they said stop TTIP immediately. Stop the negotiations, we want none of it. In this country, GMB, Unison, the National Union of Teachers, the UCU, have all come out saying no, we want to stop TTIP. The consultation which has been launched gives us an, another opportunity to say no on that particular bit as well. And we decided to try and use that as much as we possibly can. There's going to be days of action coming up through the summer, both in this country and across Europe as a whole. We're looking at something like the 12th of July as a major day of action. There'll be planning days before that, which everybody can come to. But I think there's a real opportunity here. Not just to stop it in Europe, because we've got this big movement in many of the countries in Europe at the moment. Meetings like this are happening all the way across Austria, Germany. I was in Rome to launch the Italian campaign against it, in Greece, in Spain, in France. All of the countries in Europe are rising up against this. But I promised one gentleman I'd also talk about the resistance in the US, because in the US, they're also unhappy about it. People in the US are really worried about what it will mean for them if European companies can come in and get rid of the provisions for Buy America, which support local jobs, which can get rid of the financial regulations which they've managed to introduce after the financial crash, they're also worried about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which the Obama administration is trying to negotiate at the same time, looking west for them towards the Pacific Rim. And they're worried that actually by giving the US government the fast-track authority the power to be able to negotiate these things without going to Congress, then actually they're going to be stuffed. So we are beginning to see resistance in the US, resistance throughout Europe, and I think that we have a real chance to defeat TTIP. So I'm really, really pleased to be here, really pleased that we're beginning to build this movement here. We've tried to help with this creation of this, this little pamphlet, which the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Brussels 
has printed and is translating and sending out to all of the countries of Europe as we speak. The more we can get the words out there, the better chance we have of defeating it. So I'm really pleased that everybody's here and I'm looking forward to the discussion next. Thank you. Thank you very quick response on climate change. climate change has said that their preferred outcome of TTIP will add an extra 11 million metric tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. That's their preferred outcome again. That's in the booklet, as is the, um, the link to the European Commission website. The BBC at the moment is not a threat because the audiovisual services is exempted. The French made a particular big thing, they said, we want to keep the exception culturelle, the cultural exception, which has blocked audiovisual services. The good news for us is if the U US continues to do what it says it's going to do and forces audiovisual services back in, that is one of the things which helped defeat the multilateral relief and investment in 1998 because the French just walked away from it along with a lot of civil society pressure. So actually, it's quite useful for us to say no exemptions. We want audiovisual services in, we want ISDS in, we want everything in, and then we'll get rid of the TTIP altogether. But the question of enforcement, and I think this is a really important point, I'm sorry to put a speech at the back. The enforcement question is, in, is an important one. There are several countries around the world at the moment which are saying we want no more to do with this. These are not European countries, they're countries like Ecuador and Bolivia who have pulled out of the international forums, the ICSID at the World Bank, which is the place where these domestic disputes are settled. They pulled out of that. Australia, under its previous government, said we were not, we're not going to include investor state protection in any of our trade agreements. South Africa has started tearing up its bilateral investment treaties. India is reviewing them. Indonesia has said they want no more to do with them either. Slovakia, in the European Union, has been prevented from rolling out a social health insurance policy to its people. It's being challenged now through the international arbitration tribunals. And it's now beginning to think about this in the same way as Germany has said we don't want it, in the same way as France has said they don't want it. So we're beginning to see governments, even capitalist governments beginning to say, actually, this is a step too far. But ultimately, the state and capital in advanced capitalist societies act in partnership. That is the way in which it works. Ralph Miliband, if you want to go back to his sort of work on this, is really, really good. You have a partnership of two people who are trying to do the same things and, and trying to achieve that even when they have disagreements with each other, they're still in partnership. So you've got to be aware that that is the context in which we're working. Therefore, we have to use, as Linda says, all of the, all of the channels and all of the, the, the levers we have. MEP action, if you want to say, what are you going to go home and do first? You can go straight onto the websites, either ours or the Trade Justice Movement website, and take action to MEPs. Contacting your own MPs is also really good because you might find your own MPs aren't there in a couple of weeks' time. Um, they could get really, uh, not re-elected. But I think that the key thing is to start spreading the news about it. Just get out there, start saying to people in different groups, have you heard about this? There are lots of good materials available, online films available. There's a lot of good stuff out there to try and spread the word about it. Because the more people know about it, the more pressure we can build. And it will become politically unacceptable for our representatives to back up. <coughs> and I think on that it's really interesting, the UK question. What they have said on TTIP is great, is they've said, we like all of the bits about deregulation, we like the fact that it kicks the tree huggers in the teeth, we like the fact that it gives more power to capital, we like all these things. The only bit we don't like is it's being, it's being negotiated in Brussels and not in London. <laughs>